the topic tonight is what is courage what is courage I talk about how it takes um, courage in these times and Daniel is displaying this courage as we're gonna see here in the text and he's our example he models for us how to navigate persecution and how to navigate decrees and laws and things that are bent on um, deducing and reducing the presence of God in the life of the people of God, even with our children. As some of you have told me that you study these lessons with your kids and you sit around a table. What a wonderful thing that you can uh, force them in the house <laughs> to have to listen to you before they eat. And uh, it's like going to Salvation Army. When I go to Salvation Army, um, we f they feed them and they give them a place to stay for the night. But before they can eat or get a place to stay, they got to hear the word of the Lord. And sometimes I'm teaching or preaching down there in the past regularly. And uh, boy, at first they would tell me like, hurry up, hurry up. You know, you could see they were bored. But I believe God had sent me down there. And so... I started relating well with uh, the people that were there and they were like, keep going, keep going, we can eat later. And they realized that the word of God is more important than physical food. Well, Daniel and the Hebrew boys are held captive in Babylon. The king of Babylon has now had a dream that he can't figure out. That's kind of where we left off. So picking up where we left off, a decree, a decree law has been put in place to kill all of the king's advisors, and that would include Daniel and the Hebrew boys. But I want us to watch Daniel, Daniel chapter two, verse 13 through 14, it's on the screen. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with what? wisdom and discretion say that wisdom and discretion notice he didn't panic he just needed to have an audience with the king you know we're always talking about speaking truth to power we have to be able to get to the powers that be we got to have an entry we got to have a way and sometimes god will create a way to where we have to go to the king or we have to go to those that are in power just to save our very own lives and i really feel like in my heart of heart that's kind of where we're going and kind of where we are right now and that's why we can't stay out of governmental issues that's why christians can't stay out of politics that's why we can't stay out of legislative sessions that's why we need to have born again people on the supreme court that's why we need to be able to do that because we need to have the voice of god in places that mean things where legislation is being made today we're being hit with all kinds of decrees if you will the laws legislatures trying to exercise the voice of god out of mainstream society and this is what i'm trying to get y'all to see law after law is being passed to try and silence the voice of god laws are being written to try and lock down and to disarm the people of God, to make us weaponless, if you would. Uh, you can believe in your God, but you have no power, no authority, because uh, they, they minimize uh, who we are. And the tactic is, is generally limiting the preaching of the word. Let me go over here. Limiting the preaching and the teaching of the word, censoring the preaching of the gospel. And that's nothing new. See, the gospel is the power of God under salvation to all who believe. The devil knows that the preaching of the cross is to those that are perishing foolishness, but to those of us which are saved, it's the power of God. And if you can keep us from preaching the cross in public places or even from our pulpits because of laws and because of things, they're now calling some of the uh, preaching and teaching on immorality and, and fornication and homosexuality, they're now trying to legislate it as hate speech. When what you're trying to do is not bash or hate anybody, you're trying to identify who people are and present the gospel of Jesus Christ to them that they might be saved. 
We're not afraid of people who have a different lifestyle than us. I'm not afraid of people or run from people who choose to live a particular way in life. Remember, and such were some of you. But now you are washed and now you are sanctified. There's no big sin and little sin. There's no worse sin over the other sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of my amens are out having dinner tonight with their loved ones. I think some of you are sitting here wishing you were there as well. I need you to focus in on me and pull on me tonight because I know we're in a teaching session, but there's just something going on that I just need to put fire in some of you. And I need you to get the, the reason why I'm even sharing this particular series. I want to nail it home with you. I don't want you to try to get so intellectual that you simply only take notes and you don't let it sink into your spirit and get into your heart heart because if that thing reaches your spirit you will say amen if that thing gets past your intellect you will clap your hand that thing get past your mindsets and get past your distractions on this february the 14th you will see jesus so remember it happened when the church first started they tried to censor the preaching of the gospel and the teaching about jesus rubbed the powers that be the wrong way even then in acts chapter 3 verse number 17 here's what it says but to keep this matter, this preaching, this man that just got healed by the preaching of the gospel from spreading any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. And they called them in and ordered them, the disciples, the Peter and John, to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And that's something not, they put a decree. They, that's the law. Don't you teach or preach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, whether it is right before God to obey you rather than God, you decide. For it is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. Good God Almighty. So watch this. We have to be able to handle our naysayers as Daniel did with wisdom and tact. All right. Just like Daniel did. He used wisdom and discretion. So we're also told to be ready to do the same. First Peter chapter three, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, with humility and respect to people that ask you. It is crazy for us to be living in this world and then somebody is trying to figure out what's going on in the world and they see you living and acting differently in the world and then they come to you to ask you a question about you, why you're like you are and you don't have an answer for them and you get haughty and act crazy and disrespect them and, and wonder why they're asking you. They're asking you because you ought to know and I'm going to show you what you ought to know. When stuff is going down, we can't be silent. We can't act funny. Even worse, we can't have the wrong answers. Uh, when people ask us about our faith, we have to be able to give them right answers. So like the early Christian, here's what they said when Peter and John were taken in and said, don't you teach a priest no more in this name. And stuff was coming down, decrees were putting out to try to stop this move of God. They said, it is impossible for us. Not to speak of what we have both seen and heard. It's impossible. After that, you've tasted of the heavenly gift and the powers of the worlds to be. It is impossible for you to not be able to speak and say out loud to anybody that would ask of you what you have both seen and heard. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries. Hallelujah. So this is why our testimonies are so important. God has been good to us and we've got to let folk know that he has. We've got to also hold on to our testimony. The devil's trying to embarrass us. He's trying to ruin our reputations and that's what you need to understand. He can't get our souls but he can make us try to cuss God and die as Job. He can do stuff and stuff can happen to us so that he wants you to let go of your testimony. But I need about 55 people that says I know too much about him devil. You can't make me doubt him. 
I'm going to hold on and wait till my change comes. I've had heartache and pain. I've had sickness. I have lost, almost lost my mind. I have been depressed. But I've been oppressed. But look at me. I ain't going nowhere. I still believe that God is God all by himself. I still believe. And I still know he that had begun to work in me shall perform it unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to tie a knot at the end of the rope and hold on. I may be dangling, but I ain't letting go. I'm going to hold on. Matter of fact, if I let go, that's all right because he got me. I just believe that God has me. I'll never leave you nor forsake you is what he said. So we've got to let the world know. That our courage and our faith is built upon the unshakable, unmovable truth that we find in the word of God. I told you to end the last session that governments are going to eventually fall and fail. Rulers will eventually die off. Economies will collapse. But Peter said not the word, for the word of God liveth and abideth forever. Oh, we have three things that we can't let go of that we need to learn of and we need to master uh, what the effect of these things are in our lives one of them is the blood the blood the other is the word of our testimony and the other is the word of God somebody say the blood the blood uh, our testimony our testimony and the word of God word of God the Bible says of his government or his kingdom Jesus there is no end the gates of hell, even in this church that he built, will not prevail against this church. So I want to prophesy. I want to prophesy just like it was in the days of Daniel. you got to see this because as things seem to get worse and worse and worse, even right now in our day, I want you to know that soon the Ancient of Days is going to walk in. And he's going to give the victory to the saints of God. And the saints of God are going to possess the kingdom forever and forever. Come on, I just want you to know that there's one that's seated on the throne. And one day, I don't care what it looks like, I don't care how bad it appears, he's going to step in and hand us the victory. We don't earn it, we didn't fight for it, we didn't win it, it's already been won. But because of your perseverance and because you endured and because you held on to your testimony, he's going to give you the victory and you're going to possess what he promised forever and ever we need to be strong though and have a good courage we need to stand on God's word here's three things that we need to do we need to stand on who God says he is say that stand on who God says he is and tell our children number two we need to stand on who God says we are say it stand on who God says we are and tell our children and number three, we need to stand on what you believe God can do. Say it. Stand on what you believe God can do. And do what? Tell our children. Blame everything on God. Blame the house on God. Blame the car on God. And bring the food on the table. Bring, blame the clothes in the closet. Blame the school and the education that they're getting. Blame it all on God. Blame the air they breathe on God. Let them know that it's all God. You know who God is. You know who God says you are. And you stand and believe what God can do. Daniel said that God is mighty. And when you know him, you can be strong and do great exploits. So this story is not complete without us. It's like Cody Rhodes. I've got to finish the story. It's just not complete without us. We have the baton now, and we have to complete our leg of the race. What a lot of people have failed in the kingdom of God is that they thought that this race that we run as Christians is a marathon. But marathoners get tired, and a lot of them don't complete the race. But this is not a marathon. And based on our life being but a vapor, it's simply a relay and a very short leg for us. If your life is but a vapor here today and go on tomorrow, then when you receive the baton, when the baton comes to you and you're running in this race, you don't have a whole lot of time, but you have to finish your race. You have to finish your leg 
and you pass the baton on. There are others before us that have run the race, and uh, they're in Hebrews 11 as the great hall of faith, where they endured hardness, where they were sawn in half, where they, and they were not fulfilled and complete, and they didn't um, receive everything that God had for them because we hadn't run yet. And, and, and the Bible says that they're that great cloud of witnesses that are in the grandstands cheering us on. Run, baby. Run, baby. Get up. I did. Run, baby. Come on. You can do it. Get up. You, it's going to be all right. Trust me. going to be some dark nights, but it's going to be all right. You're going to get some cramps, but it's going to be all right. Yeah, yeah. Dehydrated sometimes, but it's going to be all right. So they're cheering us on. So the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12, it's on the screen, verse 1, we are surrounded by a great cloud of people whose lives tell us what faith means. So let us run the race that is before us and never, say that, never give up. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. I like verse 2. Let us look only to Jesus, the one who began our faith and who makes it perfect. He suffered death on the cross, but he accepted the shame as if it were nothing because of the joy that God put before him. And now he is sitting at the right hand of God's throne. Think about Jesus' example. He held on while wicked people were doing evil things to him. So do not get tired and stop trying. Peter calls him our perfect example of suffering, how we should follow in his footsteps. And so you need to get this in your spirit. You need to understand that we can look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Things have been looking bad at, our, at the time of this text in Daniel chapter 2 uh, for he and the Hebrew boys. And as such, they look bad for us today too. But we've gotten to the chapter in Daniel that talks about the people of God. It's time to decide whose side they're going to be on. And it's time for us to decide whose side we're going to be on. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. <laughs> but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Say that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a conscious decision that you have to make. You have to decree, you have to declare that you're on the Lord's side. When Joshua saw that angel, that, that theophany, that Old Testament appearance of, of God, of, of, the, of Yahshua in, in the Old Testament, when he saw him, uh, he panicked and he said, whose side are you on? He said, I ain't on nobody's side. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. I'm here. You better find out what side you hold because I'm here to represent me. And so we have to decide to serve God. For those who have confidence in the Constitution, it's amazing how people will argue us with us based on the Constitution and, and the laws that have been legislated. I had a pretty intense discussion today with a, a lawmaker, with a lawyer. Uh, about how people today feel like certain things are permissible. A lot of libertine, a lot of libertarian, left-wing people feel like a lot of this stuff is permissible simply because it's legislated. And uh, and our legislature, in some kind of way, sometimes supersedes the word of God. And um, sometimes uh, legislature and laws um, are greater than, in the minds of some people, God himself. But I want you to hear a former legislator, the 16th president of the United States of America. Uh, you know who that is, right? Abraham Lincoln. For some of y'all that didn't know, you, you shouldn't have slept doing social studies in high school and middle school. The 16th president is Abraham Lincoln. And here's what he said in a senatorial debate in 1858 with Senator Stephen Davis. He said, and I quote, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is whether we are on God's side. For God is always right, regardless of what we might see. Imagine if you had a president like that in the White House today in the United States of America. A president who convictingly says 
that the Lord is always right, regardless of what we see. It is an awful thing to forget God. Every nation that forgets their God, the Bible says, is turned into hell. Abraham Lincoln was standing on the word of God. His position was based on the truth found in the Holy Writ, the Bible. He says, God is always right. And literally it says, whether we can see it or not. If you do things God's way, it's going to eventually be all right. But the operative word there is what? Eventually. So what did Daniel do when the decree was put out? He got an appointment with the king. Verse 16, Daniel 2. So Daniel went in and requested the king to grant him time that he might disclose the interpretation to the king. Nobody could do this. Nobody. All the magicians, the sorcerers, all of these folk enchanters, all of them came and none of them could do anything. So Daniel said, I got this. And he courageously went to see the king. He asked for a little time for he and the Hebrew boys to pray to God and to seek God. And I need you to know this. Whenever you go to represent God, the first thing you ought to do is what? Pray to God. Pray before you go. And then when you get there, do what? Pray. And after you leave, do what? Pray. And so those are the things that these boys knew and understand. So Daniel didn't run from the battle. He was no separatist. Neither was he a syncretist. He was not on one of the extremes. He ran right into the battle. He knew that his relationship with God meant nothing if he wasn't willing to stand up and let God shine through him. Our profession of faith is nothing if we won't let our light so shine before men that others might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Come on, help me here, somebody. You can talk about it all you want to, but it's time to rise and shine. And God is with us. I believe that it's time to let the world know that we are God's. Amen. Capital G-O-D-S, belonging to God. Amen. We are his possession, right? The earth is eagerly awaiting for the manifestation of the children of the sons of God. For God to reveal who his people are, that's us. And remember this, you got to get this. I believe something very powerful here. I believe that it's time to let the world know that we are God. But I want you to understand that Jesus said the world hated me and it will hate you. And here's what God gave me today. And I shared it with a group of people today and it blessed me. I had to say it tonight. Never said it before. But here's what I felt in my spirit. It's okay if the world hates you because of God. But it's not okay if the world hates God because of you. Amen. We got to let the world know that we belong to God. So let's start carrying our Bibles again and not just our mechanical devices. Amen. Let, let's give our testimony every chance we get, regardless of where we are. I've been doing this so much lately now, and people are just coming to Christ like this. When they put up the number of the salvations that occurred over this past year, I said, well, that's way short. I know I had that many myself, where, where I just share with people wherever I am as an extension of this local church. And as a result of being a part of this corporate body, Whoever I lead to Christ, you, you get a little something in your crown too. You know, whoever you lead to Christ, come on, your, your partner, your friend, and those that you're connected with, it's a corporate move of God. There are corporate blessings that come. Sometimes it's just good to be a part of a whole. It's like being on a team, like when Kansas City played the other day in the game there were a couple of guys who made some bonehead plays uh one time the guy seemingly looked like he had cost them the game when he caught the pass he was spun around and went back the other way and lost yards on the play when they were driving down the field all right so for a moment there all of the commentators and everybody was oh my god i can't believe he did that that could have cost even told him that could have cost him the game and this and that but kansas city wound up winning Right. So there's some times when we do some bonehead stuff, but the team wins. Yeah. Amen. Even though we stupid. Come on, y'all. Even though we had a bad play, even though we had to be taken out of the game, 
but we eventually win. That's the corporate nature of the body of Christ. You, people make mistakes, but we all win. That's why when anybody is victorious, we're all victorious. Uh, come on, y'all. That's why the church ain't going nowhere. You can have whole local churches that shut down, but the church ain't going nowhere. That's just a part of the body that needs fixing, needs a little mending. But the whole message is that the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Come on, I need some football fans to say amen. amen. It's not time to draw back because of persecution. Here's my favorite verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my brethren, beloved, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. A verse that I learned ooh, so many years ago. I got it from the Florida Mass Choir. Be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And yeah, and um, we have one of our members that is on that album. That uh, how many of you remember? Old lady, old lady, are you in there? Vernon Bracy it was singing that part. It'll all be over after a while. <laughs> After a while, and for some of you young people don't have a clue what I'm talking about, Google it. Florida Mass Choir, old lady, it'll all be over <laughs> after a while. So we are the people of God, and we live as Christians in a non-Christian world. This is a literally post-Christian, pluralistic, secular, pagan, uh, post-modern world that we live in. And we've got to be courageous, in particular in our teaching and our preaching. Uh, not just our teaching and preaching, but in our teaching and preaching of the truth. Amen. You have a lot of preachers. There are many voices in the world, and none of them are insignificant. They all mean something to somebody. So when we stand, we have to stand and have to share truths that are enduring throughout all generation. Truth. When you really hear truth, you can't shake it. When you hear something that you know came from God, that thing will ring in your head all day, all night. You'll find yourself trying to repeat it the next day. You'll find yourself going back, looking at your notes or pulling it up and getting the stream and going to that particular place and listening to it again. That's what I thought she said. That's what I thought he said. And you'll go back and you'll try to find that. That's the way truth is. Truth is lasting. So we can't back down like Daniel. We got to run to the battle with truth truth we got to be courageous here it is in our preaching daniel 2 24 then daniel went in to see arioch whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of babylon to kill him daniel said to him don't kill the wise men take me to the king and i will tell him the meaning of his dream arioch quickly took daniel to the king and said i have found one of the captives from judah who will tell the king the meeting of his dream. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belshazzar, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters or encanters, musicians or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now, King baby, I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. I'm going to walk all back up into your house when you was on your bed back when you first had the dream. And I've been to lay this thing out to you. I'm not just going to interpret the dream for you, but I'm going to tell you what the dream is. Because it is God who knows the secrets of a man's heart. It is God who directs the hearts of kings. It is God. So there's a God in heaven. Look at Daniel. Courageous, confident, and humble at the same time. He's using wisdom and tact. Remember, he showed honor to the king. Oh, king. He respected the authority of the king, but was not afraid to speak truth to that power. Actually, he spoke truth to anybody that would listen to him because Daniel was that type of dude. He knew that it was not his job to defend the truth, but it was his job to proclaim the truth. And so many of us try to defend the truth in our limited understanding and our finite reason and ability. We don't have 
the ability to understand every jot and every tittle of the scripture so we don't debate with people over things that we still don't understand just yet. It's almost like God calling Moses and so many people think that Moses is this super great leader and God called him because he was a friend of God and he saw God face to face. No, no, not when God first sent Moses. When he called Moses and he said, I want you to go, Moses turned around and said, well, if I go, who shall I say sent me? And, and Moses was there like, who is you? You know, I need to know a little bit more about you. And God said to him, I am that I am. Whatever you going to need me to be, I am that. Right now, you go in your limited knowledge. And you go out there and you, with your stick and a stutter. And you tell Pharaoh, I said, I am said, let my people go. And sometimes we go with the limited knowledge of God. Never did a revelation of who God is, but we still got to go and we got to go and proclaim the truth that we know. All we have to do is say what we're convinced about. All we got to do is have our testimony. All we got to do is be covered by the blood. All we got to do is have as much of the word of God as we know and just hang in there. But they start taking you down these other roads. I don't know about all that. All I know is I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. All I know is that he saved me. And all I know is my life has changed. And I always tell people, you don't like me now. You would have hated me then. I, I just want you to know that a change. A wonderful change has come over me. And, and, and you all be glad about it. And y'all stop. I'm going to give you this one last time, but I want you all to stop using this testimony. I'm going to let you use it. I'm going to tell you one more time, but I need you all to stop. I'm going to give you one time to use it. So put it in your back pocket. And after you use it, just, just one more time. I don't ever want you to use it again. <laughs> you better be glad I'm saved. <laughs> I pulled up to the uh, middle school the other day, picking up my grandson, and when I pulled up, I went in the exit. I went in the wrong way. I do it all the time. I'm the pastor, chancellor of the school, the founder of the school. I can go where I want to go, right? So everybody's trying to get out. So I came the other way, and this lady was driving the car, and she wasn't moving. So I went all the way to the left. I wasn't even on the road, but those bumpers were in the road, so she didn't want to go over the bumper. So she went all the way the same way I did, but she didn't know I was going to just park. So I just pulled up and parked. And so that lady looked, I can see her in the car. So I, I jump out the truck. She don't know who I am. I jump out the truck. So she's thinking I'm jumping out the truck because I got something to say to her because she wouldn't get out the way. And the other lady on the other side was, oh, Lord, it's the bishop. Oh, Lord, it's the bishop. <laughs> and so she, she knew who I was. So I got to the window and she was like this. She was huffing. I said, what's wrong, baby? You all right? You all right? Y'all got to get this. You all right? And so she says, sir, you about to make me live up to the saying on my shirt. I said, what your shirt say? Let me see it. She pulled it out. She says, half saved, half holy. <laughs> no, it said half hood, half hood, half holy. Yeah, it said half hood, half holy. I said, oh, you letting that hood out, huh? You let that hood out. Let me let, me let your hood down. Uh, wound up meeting her, loving on her, ministered to her, stayed with her about 45 minutes. Um, she moved down here, been looking for a real preacher, real church. She had a great church in Atlanta, I know the pastor there. And she just had an adopted child and the whole shebang. She was just a sweetie pie. Used to be the pastor's wife's alma bearer and was down here and alone at her lady's church home. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, sow into her life. And I sowed a substantial amount into her life. And she just melted at the wheel and, um, and wept and was broken. And um, it was basically the reason why I had to almost go hood on her. Or oh, she go hood on me. But God allows that to happen sometimes. But sometimes you got to learn how to control your hood is what I'm trying to get you to do. Control your hood. Now, had she jumped out and went to swinging, it would have been a different story. So I'm glad she was saved. <laughs> so he knew Daniel that his job was not to defend the truth, but to proclaim the truth. So the results of the preaching, the end of the result is up to God. So Daniel knew, you got to get this, that there was a God in heaven, right? Amen. But you miss emphasis being new. 
He knew it. He didn't hear about it. He knew it. He had been taught it. He had been trained in it. He had been raised in it. This man was a teen, and he knew that there was a God in heaven. You just got to know that there's a God in heaven. I don't want you to miss that. You got to know that there's a God in heaven. So what is this courage that I speak of? Courage. What makes a slave a king? Courage. Listen, so courage, put it on the screen. Courage is defined biblically as the heart and the seat of one's deepest feelings and convictions. It's the seat of one's deepest feelings and convictions. Courage reveals what we're really made of. Courage reveals what's really in our hearts when stuff comes to threaten us and our safety or even our family's safety. We become courageous. We become brave and, and bold. How we enter the ring to fight is a test of our courage. It shows what's inside of us. I just came back from the Royal Rumble in St. Petersburg, and there were a couple of fruity cakes in the Royal Rumble who came running out, and they were scared to get in. They didn't want to get in that ring. Yeah, you had, you had, you you had some people in that ring that you know I wouldn't get in there with your body. I mean, it was just it was it was awesome. And then you had people that would walk out when they would give them music, poof, and they just walk out, poof, 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 you know, they just, poof, 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 you know, oh, I don't want to do the Cody cheer, that's my man. But, you know, they, they came in and they ran into the ring. They jumped to the ring with courage, with, with what was on the inside of them. They, 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 they were ready for the battle. They were ready for the rumble. And Daniel courageously enters the ring with the king. And he says to the king these words, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. O king, there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. It's been said that the opposite of courage just may be fear. Fear, fear, fear. You know what courage is? Where courage comes from? Courage comes from trusting God. Amen. Courage comes from trusting God. Fear comes from trusting ourselves. You don't get it. Fear comes from trusting ourselves. Fear can be defined as faith in what the enemy is saying. Say that with me. Fear can be defined, it's on the screen, as in what the Look at it with me and say it real loud, everybody together. Fear can be defined as faith in what the enemy is saying. I don't know why when I say look at that, some of you never look up at that. There's a purpose for it because seeing it and hearing it and saying it, we forget 90% of what we hear within 72 hours of having heard it. What helps the percentage is when we see it and say it at the same time. Hear it, see it, say it. That's the reason for the screens. And then secondly, courage comes from believing what God has said. Say that. Courage comes from believing what God has said. So fear can be defined as faith in what the enemy is saying, but courage comes from believing what God has said. So how many times have you heard me say that? One word from the Lord can cancel all of the words of the devil. Everything the enemy has been saying to you, all you need is one word of what God has said to you and what the enemy is saying don't even make sense. You start making that joke of speaking tongues without interpretation. You say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've got faith in God. Y'all didn't get that one word from the Lord can cancel all of the words of the enemy. So I heard a story of a man who displayed a little courage. Y'all got to get this. He, he was boasting about having courage. He said, uh, with a confident tone in his voice, he said to everybody, well, listen, you know, once I cut off a lion's tail with my pocket knife. Courage. So somebody back asked him and said, well, why didn't you cut off his head? Then the man sheepishly replied, oh, oh, I'm sorry, somebody had already done that. <laughs> it's just, just, I, just, I, just, I just thought I'd let you, somebody, 
I, I cut off a lion tail with a pocket knife. He was already dead. That's not courage. Romans 1 16, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. First Peter said we ought to be ready to give an answer to every man. So when we are courageous and take a stand, we can experience all that God has promised us. Let's see the conclusion of the matter. Daniel interprets the dream, and the entire nation gets impacted. Daniel 2 26. Here we go. Or 46. Here we go. Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel. And worshipped him after he explained the dream. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and to burn sweet incense before him. The king said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of gods. The Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this secret. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon. As well as chief over all his wise men. At Daniel's request. While it was good to go. The, the king appointed Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego. To be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon. While Daniel remained in the king's court. Daniel, your God is the God of God, the God of kings. Good God from Zion, what do you want me to do for you? Here's stuff, things, take the riches, you got it, it's yours, you can have it. And by the way, what you want me to do with them boys? I want them to be over, hey, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, come on in here. I got something for you too. So the king got the revelation of what Daniel already knew. There's only one that sits on the throne. And I, John, looked up and I saw one that sat on the throne. And Daniel obeyed God. And God blessed him in everything he did. Daniel was in captivity for over 60 years. He lived for over 60 years in a culture where he did not fit in. And he didn't just survive. He thrived. It was not in agreement, the world that he lived in with his beliefs, his convictions, his lifestyle as a child of God, as a righteous man. The Bible calls Daniel righteous, righteous man. He served four different rulers of four empires. Even when he explains the, the statue of the dream we're going to look at later, you can see these are four Gentile nations that would reign and rule at some period of time even over the people of God and cause great grief and pain, which cause grace increase and growth. For the more they're persecuted, the more they grew. So God left him in that kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom. We will equate that to the world as light. He knew his presence could bring hope in search of answers. All of those people who were looking for answers, even as the king was searching for answers to his dream. It took God to give that answer. People who represented God. So he represented not only God, but the entire people of God. Daniel and the Hebrew boys represented that creative minority, that holy remnant that God is looking for in these last days. So as a creative minority, he was able and they were to impact the entire nation. So that was Daniel's moment. That was Daniel's time. This, my friend, is our moment. This, my friends, is our time. It's our time to stand. It's our time to be courageous. While this culture is trying to intimidate us, we've got to run to the battle. We don't need to stay home and stay away and be separatists. We don't need to try to fit in and not try to make waves. We need to stand for God in the midst of it. And my favorite expression, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. And dare to make it known. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. So like in the days of Daniel, 
This culture is filled with anxiety and fear. Everybody is searching for answers. There is restlessness. Listen to me, watch me. I'm not done everywhere. There is hostility and death threats abounding. Our government is teetering on destruction. There's political unrest and there's about to be a great gulf after this next election like we've never seen before. Neighborhoods and schools are being devastated with opinions and supposed liberties that have the people who believe those things bound. Even today, during Kansas City Chiefs parade, after winning a Super Bowl, gunmen shoot and kill. People are wounded. You can't even go anywhere or do anything without the fear of death and dying. This is our modern day Babylon. Babylon. But God has placed us here to share the love of God. God has placed us here to proclaim the truth of God's word in the midst of opposition to the same. So we cannot be ashamed of the gospel. So what do we have to do? You want to prosper? You want to thrive and not just survive? You want to experience good success? God did not make us to be failures. God does not expect us not to prosper. He came that we might have life, Jesus did, and that we might have it more abundantly, that we might experience the God kind of life. As we study, we'll see 2 Chronicles 20, 20 said, Believe in the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. He'll keep you, but believe his prophets, and so shall you prosper. God does nothing except he reveals his secrets first unto his servants, the prophets. Without an oracle, a revelator, without a vision, the text says, the people cast off restraints, the people perish. You have to position yourself to hear what God is saying to you. So while you're standing there not knowing what to do, here's what that word, that word means in Proverbs, without a vision, the people perish. While you're standing there holding the rock, just holding it, just holding it, somebody needs to come along with a word, with an oracle, and say, push. Give you some direction and tell you what to do and show you where to go and show you where not to go. Show you what's available. Show you what God will do. Remind you of what God has done. What God will do is predicated on what he has done. And if we're going to be types of Daniels, types of Hananiah, Mishael's, and Azariah's, that's who God called them, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If we're going to represent them, if we're going to model them, then let's take a look. But what was written was aforetime was written for our learning, that we through knowledge and the patience of the scriptures might have hope. What happened to Israel happened as examples to us. And there's nothing that's taken us such that it's not as common to man. And, and God always makes a way of escape that we might have beams to bear it. Before you break down, you're going to break through. Come on, before you break down, you're going to break out. Come on, God knows how much you can bear. Don't let nobody tell you that ain't in the Bible. The devil is a liar. God does know how much you can bear. You don't know how much you can bear. You don't know the weight of the world. You don't know how God will rescue you. Trouble on every side persecuted, forsaken, cast down. But God always has a way of delivering the righteous. Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. Glory to God. He's a high tower. He's a shelter. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Shelter in the time of a storm. Come on. He's, he's, he'll make you a battle axe in the time of the battle. That's who God is. That's who Daniel knew he is, who he was. That's who Nebuchadnezzar found out who he was. One, so here's the verse to be strong. Here's how you make it. Joshua 1, 7 through 9. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go come on be strong and have a good courage 
don't be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go come on be strong and of a good courage come on everybody on your feet and as one nation come on as one people oh you should have been excited to jump up you should have been excited to shout with others to clap your hands with others to lift up holy hands with others not only are we destined to survive but these Hebrew boys teach us that we can also thrive. The scriptures are true. For it is God who turns the hearts of kings. It's in the hand of the holy God who Nebuchadnezzar discovered. He's the God of kings. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords and when you go and they ask you who sent you you tell them I am that I am you tell them Yahweh Jehovah Jireh they have known me but you shall know me and there's a greater revelation there's a greater light and God just wants to make himself known to his people God wants to get to know his people intimately because key in the last day is not that you knew God but it's that God knew you Amen. Father thank you for this night thank you for your precious blood thank you for the word of our testimony and thank you for the mighty word of God we do not take for granted this moment. We have heard your voice. We're not going to be ignorant of the devil's devices. And when somebody asks us what is the reason of the hope that we have, we're going to be able to give them answers. So help us, Lord God, to continue to study this word. Help us to follow this series. Help us to glean from the lives of Daniel. Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah help us God to get to know our God in a greater way for your word says when we know you we can be strong and do great exploits help us Lord God to get in that word and, and, and keep that word and, and, and to meditate in this word day and night help us to share it with our children and our children's children help us Lord God to be obedient to and help us to not be fearful of decrees and legislation and laws. And help us, Lord God, to stand even in the midst of all the vulgarity and perversion that's being presented to us through social media and television and movies and periodicals and books. God, help us to be able to stand. And after we've done all the stand, stand. Help us, Lord, to put on the whole armor of God. Help us to join arms with each other and stand as a creative minority, a holy remnant. Like it says in Zephaniah, shoulder to shoulder, we'll stand. So God, help us to be those priests that you call us to be. To not be humped back and broken, not to be entangled with the affairs of this life. Not to be enamored with the things of this world. To love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But while we're in the world, to be those change agents that you called us to be. Light and salt. Help us not to run from the battle, but help us to run to the battle. Because you're the God who reveals the secrets of men's hearts. You're the God that answers prayer. You're the God of kings. And to you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Put those hands together. We pray you were blessed by the worship experience here at the Potter's House. Make sure you share this word with a loved one on your timeline and newsfeed. And remember, there are ways that you can give. First, you can give by text by simply texting the word GIVE to 904-601-1695. Follow the prompts and you will receive a confirmation text of your gift. 
You may also give online at tphim.org backslash give. You can give through our Ministry One or Ezekiel Church app by downloading the app and following the instructions to give. Or you can mail in your gifts addressed to TPHIM at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. Once again, we thank you for your continued generosity to the Potter's House. And for those of you who have answered the call to salvation, please call or text us at 855-TPH4JAX. That's 855-874-4529. And until the next time, remember to share this message and stay connected via Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPHJAX. May God bless you and keep you until our next digital gathering.